Duchess of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, members of cabinet, senior public servants, representatives from the business community, representatives of trade and labor unions, representatives of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to this very important lecture this morning on some salient issues for resolution in CARICOM. The lecture, of course, is going to be delivered by Prime Minister Dr. Dion Ravi Gonzalez, who happens to be the longest serving Prime Minister in CARICOM at present. Not only is he the longest serving Prime Minister in CARICOM at present, but yesterday he would have celebrated 24 years as the parliamentary representative of the people of North Central Greenwood. The Prime Minister, of course, would have served in the capacity as chairman of CARICOM on several occasions. He would have chaired several committees in CARICOM, and certainly I don't think there's another leader in CARICOM who is in a better position to address these issues that he will address this morning. Therefore, I ask you at this time to put your hands together and welcome our Prime Minister, Dr. John Brianna. Thank you very much, Hans, and good morning to everyone who are here and who will be listening as we go on with today's proceedings. I want to acknowledge the presence of my cabinet colleagues and Commissioner of Police, the leadership of the police force, the senior public servants and the business executives and those who are from the labor movement. We have a number of persons from the statutory bodies here. I want to welcome everybody and I want to thank you for coming out because I know you probably would have received this notice only maybe Wednesday or thereabouts. I want to assure you that you wouldn't be here too long. <laughs> If only because I have to get to the airport to take a plane at 11.30 this morning. I have a lecture tonight at the university on matters related to financing and recovery from disaster preparedness on, the, on, on natural disasters. I want to talk this morning, as Hans King has said, about salient some salient issues for resolution in Caribou. And I know that many persons in the business community would be very concerned about many queries which have been raised in informed circles across the region about a number of matters touching and concerned in Caricom and the workers naturally would be concerned too because it relates to their own livelihoods and so to the people broadly. In 1973, the Caribbean community was established under and by virtue of the Treaty of Chagaramas. In 2001, the juridical framework for a Caribbean single market and economy was formally elaborated in the revised Treaty of Chagaramos. Although several aspects of the revised treaty in respect of the single market have been put in place, the single economy is yet to be operationalized as envisaged. It is not that some progress has not been made, but the CARICOM single economy is still to be achieved. To be sure, we have witnessed solid progress in trade facilitation, freedom of movement of CARICOM nationals, the establishment and functioning of the supranational Caribbean Court of Justice, the CCJ, in its original jurisdiction, and the enhancement of functional cooperation in areas such as education and health and security and the coordination of foreign policy. Still in each of the areas of progress, there is much that is yet to be accomplished. But more than all this, 
The core features of the CARICOM single economy are yet to be realized. Although the recently published report of the Commission to Review Jamaica's Relations with CARICOM and CARIFORUM Frameworks, the so-called Golden Report, called after its chairman, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, Bruce Golden. Although this report has proffered a highly stylized and somewhat overblown critique of the lack of progress in the implementation of the CSME, there is much truth in its lamentation that, quote, something cannot be said to have failed unless it has been tried. <coughs> the single market and economy that we so often declare is not working cannot in reality be expected to work because it has not yet been functionally established. So much time has elapsed and so much that should have been done has not been done that we are in danger of succumbing to integration fatigue without having actually integrated and we are having difficulty sustaining or renewing our commitment to the process." Unquote. In the upshot, the Golden Report has staked out, not surprisingly, a Jamaican-centered perspective from which flows a bundle of 33 recommendations with suggested timelines for implementation. Many of these recommendations are relatively run-of-the-mill sensible correctives to specific challenges or initiatives which have been canvassed repeatedly by this or that review, internal and external, of CARICOM. Some, though, are plain, unworkable, under the extant governance arrangements in CARICOM, and altered governance has been enduringly problematic. However, the Golden Report's telling recommendation with undoubted far-reaching consequences for Jamaica and CARICOM is this, quote, there needs to be a clear, definitive commitment now from each member state to a specific time-bound, measurable, and verifiable program of action to fulfill all its obligations and complete all the requirements for the single market and economy to be fully established and operational within the next five years. In the absence of such a commitment and its diligent execution, it is our recommendation that Jamaica should withdraw from the single market and economy, but seek to retain its position as a member of CARICOM in a status similar to that held by the Bahamas. It will then consider what form of trading arrangement it would wish to pursue with other CARICOM member states, unquote. This recommendation is central to the Golden Reports, menu of recommendations. It's no nonsense, take it or leave it, let us test in this regard. Infuses and sprinkles hither and thither the tenor of much of the report's analysis and its gaze into the future of the regional integration movement. Under the rubric of this central recommendation, the Golden Report lists 22 must-do items of the CSME over the next five years, or else withdrawal by Jamaica. The Golden Report has been laid in the Parliament of Jamaica. The matter is in the public domain for consideration. We do not as yet know the position of the Jamaican government on the array of the report's recommendations, especially that which occupies centrality. I suspect though, rightly or wrongly, a large body of Jamaican opinion may applaud, even if from the sidelines, given CARICOM's marginality to Jamaican political and economic discourses. My purpose today is not to review the Golden Report. Although its ideas are an influential prod on the current agenda of CARICOM and on the prospective way forward strategically for the regional economic enterprise. 
Accordingly, I consider it opportune on the eve of the 29th International Intercessional Conference of Heads of Government of CARICOM, scheduled for early next week in Haiti, to mark out some relevant territory on the salient issues at hand from the perspective of the member states of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, particularly that of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I want, having addressed that introduction to this lecture, this speech, I want to turn attention to what CARICOM is and what it is not. CARICOM is designed as a community of sovereign states without any authoritative institutional arrangement <coughs> of supranationality, save and except the Caribbean Court of Justice, as, em as exemplified in the Shaminique Myri case, among others, over the recent years. CARICOM's central mode of operation is by way of intergovernmental unanimity, profoundly respectful of each member state's sovereignty and independence. Accordingly, there is no executive governance structure akin to the European <coughs> Commission, a supranational executive mechanism which is mandated to compel obedience through targeted sanctions of member states should they fail and or refuse to comply with their solemnly agreed obligations. In CARICOM, only the CCJ in its original jurisdiction possesses a rule enforcing authority available to nationals, companies, and governments of CARICOM member states. Interestingly, no CARICOM government as yet has taken another to the CCJ for any alleged breach of relevant provisions of the revised treaty of Chagoramos, or decisions of a heads of government conference, or a material aspect of community law. Governments still seek to resolve problems in the old fashioned way, through dialogue and consensus in their intergovernmental arrangements. So CARICOM is seeking to implement the CSME but with a ramshackle governance and administrative apparatus. The much maligned CARICOM Secretariat can hardly do more than what it is empowered to do by the treaty and the decisions of conference of heads of government or meetings of the various ministerial councils or other organs of CARICOM. And on the basis of the underwhelming results of CARICOM's initiative, to alter its governance arrangements in accord with an efficacious fit for the purpose principle. I am doubtful that an appropriate supranational executive mechanism and effective CARICOM commission focused on CSME implementation is likely to evolve in the foreseeable future. Islandness and an addiction to the doctrine of the pristine Westphalian state, inclusive of its adornments of sovereignty in intra-caricom relations are likely to doom the realization of any executive caricom commission. In 2003, as a first term prime minister, I was made chairman of a subcommittee of the Conference of Heads of government on the governance issue with the mandate to reform the governance arrangements in CARICOM in order to give effect to the potentially transformative Rose Hall Declaration which emerged out of the Conference of Heads of Government held in Jamaica on the occasion of the 30th anniversary <coughs> of the establishment of CARICOM. Prime Minister P.J. Patterson of Jamaica Patrick Manning of Trinidad and Tobago, Owen Arthur of Barbados, President Barra Jagdi of Guyana and I worked diligently on this exercise. Our work was supported by three technical committees on governance, 
on the Assembly of Caribbean Community Parliamentarians and on Finance and Caricom. Headed respectively by Sir Shridat Ramphal, Professor Dennis Ben, and Professor Compton Bourne. Our committee duly reported to the heads, to the Conference of Heads of Government. A major recommendation was for the establishment of an Executive Caricom Commission to push for and superintend the CSME, a similar but not identical body to the European Commission. The Conference of Heads of Government respectively received our report, but kicked the decision-making can further down the road by appointing a technical review group under the chairmanship of Professor Vaughan Lewis to advise further on our report. The Lewis Technical Group in due course submitted its review, but the funeral rites on the Rose Hall Declaration and its attendant body of literature were by then summarily administered without fanfare. Every now and again thereafter, <coughs> CARICOM is roused by one of its governance fits and administrative reviews. In their wake, the business continues as usual in CARICOM. Important ad hoc work is being done, but it inches ever so glacially, particularly in respect of the CSME. The Golden Report is correct in its assessment that there is no appetite in CARICOM <coughs> currently and in the foreseeable future for a political union. I do not share this view, however, that the report's proposals regarding declaratory provisions in the Treaty on the Paramount Sea of Community Law on certain matters, a corresponding articulation of sanctions for certain willful non-compliance or flagrant breaches, a more effective functioning of the quasi-cabinet in CARICOM, and the permanent committee of, the amb of ambassadors, a better functioning of the ministerial councils, including the Council of Ministers for Finance and Planning, and an improved functioning of the CARICOM Secretariat, all of those things which are suggested by the Golden Report. I'm not satisfied that those will, in their composite performance, be able to oversee and drive adequately at all the full functioning of the CSME, particularly the single economy. Because remember, the CSME is about a single market and a single economy. My friend Bruce Golden, the principal author of the report, is unrealistically optimistic that these bits and pieces measures would cure the central governance limitations in respect of the CSME. Only a well-constructed, authoritative, executive CARICOM commission will be able to push and manage the CSME as a lived reality. And I do not think, too, that there is a political market for such an executive CARICOM commission. I observe only in passing that many current enthusiasts for a centralized executive driver of the CSME were lukewarm to the idea when they were in office. Then, the sacrosons of their respective national cabinets and their vainglorious declarations of a vaunted sovereignty restrained them from crossing the proverbial Rubicon of an executive authority in CARICOM. The ghost of the failed federal venture in the West Indies is yet to be exorcised, not only in Jamaica, but elsewhere too. The existing governance arrangements in CARICOM are only able, partially, to deliver achievements on its four pillars, trade and economic integration, functional cooperation, foreign policy, coordination, and security collaboration. Useful, productive work is being done on trade and single market activities and on functional cooperation. Deliverables in foreign policy coordination and security are patchy at best, but there is hardly any credible advance 
on the single economy limb of the CSME. I want to address the central question about a single economy for CARICOM. It is doubtful, given the current context of globalization, the condition of the regional economies, the unequal yoking of the member states of CARICOM, and the highly unlikely attainment of an executive CARICOM commission that a single economy can be fashioned in CARICOM now or in the foreseeable future. If this assessment is correct, and I believe it is, we ought reasonably to spend our time more usefully on the attainment of the goals resident in the other pillars of the CARICOM design. In this way, our focus is likely to yield substantial results even on modest objectives than to be in control of a permanent condition of dissatisfaction because of the elusive single economy and its essential precondition an authoritative economic uh, executive governance mechanism. From the standpoint of the OECS, including St. Vincent and Grenadines, a single economy is a non-starter unless there is a special carve-out for the OECS member states within CARICOM. Thus far, at least three larger CARICOM member states are opposed to such a carve-out. The idea is, is to take our economic union and give it a special position inside of the revised Treaty of Shadaramos so that what we do among ourselves in the OECS, others wouldn't ask to get the same treatment as to what we do to each other in the OECS. I know that the Golden Report is recommending the elimination of the differentiation between the more developed countries, MDCs, and the less developed countries, LDCs and CARICOM. But the report calls for the retention of the provision in the revised treaty for special treatment of disadvantaged countries, regions, and sectors. You see, Jamaica is defined as an MDC, which denies it certain preferential treatment. But there are regions and sectors in Jamaica which may qualify as disadvantaged and thus be eligible for special treatment under Chapter 7 of the revised treaty. Undoubtedly, in the OECS member states of CARICOM, the small size of their domestic markets, the underdeveloped manufacturing sector, the absence of oil and mineral resources, the relatively weak condition of the financial sector, and the paucity of certain vital skill sets place them at a marked disadvantage compared to the traditionally more developed countries in CARICOM, Bahamas, Guyana, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, they recognize N MDCs in the CSME. Of course, Bahamas is also an MDC, but it's not in the CSME. Further, in this era of debilitating climate change, the vulnerability and lack of resilience to natural disasters of the member countries of the OECS place them in an even more disadvantaged or precarious state and the other CARICOM member states. For us in the OECS, there's an undoubted case for a designation which accommodates the notion of small island exceptionalism on account of their structural weaknesses or deficiencies in the economies and the unfamiliarity, unprecedentedness, and urgency of the unrushing natural disasters. To be sure, the larger CARICOM countries are also subject to climate change and debilitating natural disasters. But the consequential damage and destruction has not been to the same extent as in the OECS member states. The veritable wipeout of Grenada in 2004 and Dominica in 2017 attests to this fact. The six OECS 
member states which are in the CSNE, namely Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. These are designated in the revised treaty as less developed countries, LDCs. Of course, there's Belize and there's Haiti, but I'm addressing the OECS question. These six member states of the OECS, which are in the CSME, have a total land area of 2,811 square kilometers and a population of 625,334. I want us to ponder these numbers as I talk. These six countries in the OECS constitute 25.5% of the land area and 22.5% of the population of Jamaica. The six OECS countries have a land area which is 54.8% of that of Trinidad and Tobago and 45.8% of that country's population. Huge disparities between the land area of the OECS member states and that of Guyana. Guyana has 214,970 square kilometers in landscape. Suriname, 163,820 square kilometers. And Belize, 22,966 square kilometers. But the population sizes for those three countries, Guyana, Suriname, and Belize, do not represent the same disparities. Guyana's population is 770,749. Suriname's is 547,546. Belize is 366,971. And so each of the latter two, that is Suriname and Belize, has less than the OECS member states' total population. Barbados' is landmass of 431 square kilometers is 15.3 percent of that of the OECS countries and its population of 284,977 represents 45.6 percent of that of the OECS countries in the aggregate. So we are seeing, I'm making the thesis about how we are unequally yoked and it will more it as we go along. And so that's size, that's population. Let's go now to the per capita gross domestic product. The per capita gross domestic product GDP of the CSME countries in United States dollars in 2014 is as follows. Antigua and Barbuda, 13,277. Barbados, 15,454. Belize, 4,617. Dominica, 7,002. Grenada, 7,778. Guyana, 3,628. Jamaica, 5,203. St. Kitts and Nevis, 14,123. St. Lucia, 7,291. St. Vincent the Grenadines, 7,203. Suriname, 9,120 dollars. And Trinidad and Tobago, 18,798 US dollars. It is to be noted, and these numbers which I'm going to give you here would later on be relevant to our discussion in relation to Bruce Golden's report suggestion, recommendation for full free migration, freedom of movement. It is to be noted that Antigua and Barbuda and St. Kitts and Nevis of the OECS member countries of CARICOM have a comparatively high per capita GDP figure. And it is true also that all six OECS member countries of CARICOM have much higher per capita GDP figures than those of Jamaica, Guyana, and Belize. 
but the small size and extreme vulnerability of all the OECS member states of CARICOM demand special protection and treatment within the CARICOM arrangements. Thus the demand for a special carve-out for these six CSME countries from the OECS plus Monstrat, which is in CARICOM but not is in the, C in the CSME, which has 103 square kilometers and a population of 5,179. But it has a, a GDP per capita of 9,455. The unequally yoked nature of the six OECS members, countries of the CSME, plus Montserrat and Anguilla, all members of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, Anguilla is an associate member of, the, of CARICOM, all these countries, members of the currency union, this unequally yoked nature of these countries is further emphasized in their trade in goods, visible trade, with Trinidad and Tobago. In 2008, the year of the onset of the global economic depression, Trinidad and Tobago exported to the OECS ECCU countries 1.3 billion Eastern Caribbean dollars and imported just 56.7 million Eastern Caribbean dollars worth of goods from them. Thus occasioning for Trinidad and Tobago a hefty trade surplus in relation to these countries of EC 1.27 billion dollars. Trinidad and Tobago exported EC 816 in, in 2016. We move from 2018 to 2016. In 2016, Trinidad and Tobago exported 869.97 million Eastern Caribbean dollars to these OECS ECCU countries and imported 42.57 million dollars EC from them, thus giving rise to a large trade surplus of EC 827.38 million dollars in favor of Trinidad and Tobago. In the case of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2015, our country imported 158.8 million dollars Eastern Caribbean from Trinidad and Tobago and exported to that country EC $21 million, thus, according to Trinidad and Tobago, a lopsided trade surplus of EC $137.78 million. Further, the veritable subsidy which producers of goods and services in Trinidad and Tobago receive places producers in the OECS member countries in a marked disadvantageous position relative to their counterparts in Trinidad and Tobago. And you may say, what subsidy is this? It is well established that the consumers and producers in Trinidad and Tobago pay far less for energy than those in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the rest of the OECS ECCU. Additionally, Energy is one of the commodities which attracts the payment of the common external tariff CET when imported from a non caricom source, unless, as in the case of energy products under the Petro-Carib arrangement with Venezuela, a blanket exemption, exemption from the CET is accorded by the Council for Trade and Economic Development, quoted. This means, in effect, that CARICOM importers of energy cannot easily shop around for supplies from cheaper non-Trinidadian sources. Clearly, this is unfair and wrong since the energy industry in Trinidad and Tobago is a modern, highly competitive one. It ought not to be accorded this CET protection. And I reiterate the fundamental point that producers elsewhere in CARICOM including in St. Vincent and Grenadines, especially the manufacturers, find it challenging to compete with their Trinidad and counterparts because of that country's cheaper energy. 
see a manufacturer is nodding his head because he's finding difficulty with his pasta. Because of that. <laughs> it is for this reason that many manu Jamaican manufacturers are seeking to relocate to Trinidad. Manufacturers from the OECS have no such heft to enable them to so act. In any event, jobs are sucked from elsewhere and are thus aggregated in Trinidad. The pricing of energy contributes immensely to the unequal yoking of CARICOM member states. The OECS member states were reluctant originally to sign on to the CSME precisely because of the nature of the economies, small size, and a highly competitive disadvantage. Indeed, the OECS had caused a technical study to be conducted to assess the impact of CARICOM's trading regime in our country's manufacturing sector. The study concluded that it had been adverse to the interests of the OECS manufacturers. The settled view, too, was that the CSME, particularly its single economy component, would create additional competitive challenges for us in the OECS. Nevertheless, we in the OECS signed on to the CSME because of our reasonable expectation that Chapter 7 of the Revised Treaty on disadvantaged countries, region, and sectors would be compensatory. In other words, what we lose on the swings, we will gain on the roundabouts. This has turned out not to be the case. It is largely a mirage. It is for this reason, among others, that we in the OECS now seek a special carve-out in the revised Treaty of Chagaramos consequent particularly on the inauguration in 2010 of the revised Treaty of Basté establishing the Organization of Eastern Caribbean Economic Union. But as I have said before, we are being blocked in our quest by at least three larger and more resource-endowed CARICOM member states. Article 142 of Chapter 7 of the revised Treaty of Chagaramos stipulates that, quote, and the chapter 7, just bear this in mind, that that is the chapter to provide some protection for the LDCs. And for economically disadvantaged countries, regions, and sectors. Those two categories may be coterminous, but they're not necessarily so because Jamaica is not an LDC, but it would have within it disadvantaged regions and sectors. Article 142 of Chapter 7 of the Revised Treaty of Chagarama stipulates that, quote, the provisions of this chapter shall have effect for the purpose of establishing a regime for disadvantaged countries, regions, or sectors within the framework of the treaty, as well as a special regime for less developed countries in order to enhance their prospects for successful competition within the community and redress to the extent possible any negative impact of the establishment of the CSME. So the framers of the treaty understood that the CSME is likely to be disadvantageous to less developed countries and therefore they put in some protection. As we know, the Golden Report wants to remove some of those protections except those which would relate to Jamaica. <laughs> Chapter 7 of the Revised Treaty of Chagaramas. Well, we're talking a serious business here. This is bread and butter. And you can't travel over breadfruit tree. You have to. This is serious business, which we all have to think about and reflect as to how we're going forward. Chapter 7 of the Revised Treaty of Chagaramas has three parts. Part 1 is preliminary. Part 2, regime for disadvantaged countries, regions, and sectors. 
and part three, special regime for less developed countries. Among other things, this chapter, this chapter seven addresses measures to redress disadvantage arising from economic dislocation, promotion of investment, measures relating to the services sector and relating to the right of establishment, support for sensitive industries, technical and financial assistance, the CARICOM Development Fund, and the promotion of industrial development. Of especial significance to St. Vincent and the Grenadines have been the CARICOM Development Fund and the promotion of industrial development under Article 164 of the revised treaty. 164 is of great importance. Mr. Davy, in respect of his flour and feed, he knows that. And the 150 people who work down there, they know that. So this is, this is not an abstract matter. I just, I just want us to know how serious this business is. So, two things here, the CARICOM Development Fund and Article 164. The CARICOM Development Fund commenced later than we all anticipated. And although the first cycle of funding was somewhat helpful to us, it was underfunded. The second cycle is likely to be no more than 60% of the first cycle's funding. And I pause to say this, Jamaica had agreed in the first cycle they not. They will put money in, but they will not ask for any. They will make any application. The Golden Report is saying they are urging Jamaica to put again, but to take out also. But we are likely to have the fund to less than sixty percent as to what it was in the first cycle. Article six one sixty four has assisted, for example, our production an intra-regional export of flour and animal feed in St. Vincent and Grenadines. Article 164, 1, sub 1, says this. Upon application made in that behalf by the less developed countries, the Council for Trade and Economic Development may, if necessary, as a temporary measure in order to promote the development of an industry in any of these states, authorize such states to suspend community origin treatment to any description of goods eligible, therefore, on grounds of production in one or more less developed countries." Unquote. <coughs> Securing Article 164 protection is always problematic. I've had to deal with it on more than one occasion to get extensions of coverage for flour and animal feed. We have added beverages, soft drinks and the like. Securing it has always been problematic. Now, the Golden Report recommends the elimination of the distinction between MDCs and LDCs. In effect, this would remove completely the special regime of less developed countries detailed in Part 3 of Chapter 7 of the revised Treaty of Shagaramas. And Part 3 includes Article 164. And Part 3 also embraces protective measures in respect of import duties, community origin issues, incentive regimes, the common external tariff, certain protections in relation to public undertakings, and the use of technological and research facilities of the MDCs by the LDCs. In Jamaica, for instance, which is an MDC, has uh, research facilities in relation to medicinal marijuana, under this treaty, we could ask them for assistance, under this part of the treaty. But that part is the case is being made in the Golden Report for us to get rid of the special regime. We get rid of the distinction between MDCs and LDCs. 
lot of stuff which I've just read out there may sound technical and esoteric to you and some may consider it to be upside down Chinese, but each of them, I assure you, has its own importance for us. The Golden Report's recommendation for the establishment and operation of the CSME within five years, failing which Jamaica's withdrawal is problematic for the CSME and Jamaica. But I cannot speak for Jamaica. So I will address this issue further, more broadly, from the vantage point of the OECS. The two central matters for the CSME, and more particularly for the single economy, as correctly identified by the Golden Report, are one. Follow me as I go with these. One, macroeconomic convergence, including a fiscal responsibility framework, debt management strategy, abolition of exchange controls, and full currency convertibility. That's the first bundle that Golden, the Golden Report wants, and I know other people in moving to the CSME, and as I say, they're correctly identified. To get to the single economy, you have to have macroeconomic convergence. You have to have, and this includes a fiscal responsibility framework. framework. Fiscal responsibility means how all, what we all manage our central government finances. The debt management strategy, how we deal with those things for public sector debt. Abolition of exchange controls, well that's not such an important issue in relation to us immediately. And full currency convertibility. And I'll talk a little bit more about that one. So that's the first bundle, macroeconomic convergence. The second, full free movement of people throughout the community subject only to exclusions for security and public health reasons. The issue of the abolition of exchange controls is not a particularly compelling one, since only two countries, Barbados and Belize, currently operate them across the board. But it would still be helpful to secure this abolition in these two countries. Of course, when I talk a little later about Trinidad, and Tobago with foreign uh, unavailability of foreign exchange for our traders, though they don't have foreign exchange controls, this foreign currency is rationed in a particular manner. They may not use the word ration, they may say there's a queue and you have to find yourself in the queue. <laughs> but they, the full the, the effect on, on our farmers, our traders, is a rationing. So I want us to turn to other relevant matters in relation to the single economy. It is difficult for me to envisage in practical terms an effective fiscal responsibility framework, an efficacious debt management strategy, and full currency convertibility in the absence of a central authoritative monetary mechanism and in a context of individual central banks, economies at various levels of development and possessed of varied structural features, currencies with, wi with, diff with widely different real effective exchange rates to the US dollar, and individual monetary policies which are hugely divergent. It is in that climate that the, the call, as I see it, for a fiscal responsibility framework, efficacious debt management strategy, and full currency convertibility is to take place. And I don't say it's going to take place in the absence of a central authoritative monetary mechanism. And I give you the context in which we currently are, and whether anybody reasonably thinks that that could happen. Even within the currency union, Eastern Caribbean currency union, there are immense challenges 
in fashioning and implementing a common fiscal responsibility framework and debt management strategy beyond the setting of targets. The problems attendant on achieving these in the wider CARICOM are mind-boggling. I am open to be educated as to how this would work practically in the context of CARICOM. But I remain not only agnostic, but atheistic on it. I simply cannot see effective macroeconomic convergence between the economies of our currency union and Barbados on the one hand, and those of Jamaica, Guyana, Suriname, Belize, and Haiti on the other. I cannot see too an effective macroeconomic convergence between Trinidad and Tobago on the one hand, and the latter five named countries on the other hand. I can envisage though the possibility, in fact the probability, of a convergence between the economies of Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, and of our currency union. Undoubtedly, it is possible to draw up a list of guiding principles on macroeconomic convergence within a CSME, but they are most unlikely to go beyond declaratory good intentions with absolutely no sanctions possible. In any event, it is the market and the real world of trade and production which determine full currency convertibility. It's not a matter that you discuss in a room, in theory and abstractly. It is the market which will determine it. Because trade and production, what will determine how this quote-unquote full currency convertibility will work. I am sure that large numbers of consultants and agencies are enthused at the prospect of juicy fees for their possible engagement on unworkable full <laughs> currency convertibility in the extant circumstances. In the currency union, I say that because we are likely to be bombarded by a number of persons who will tell me that it can work. In the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, its member countries have one central bank with a common currency. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, the ECCB, has regulatory oversight of all onshore commercial banks. The ECCB is thus responsible in the first and last instances for monetary stability and financial sector stability by way of the regulatory regime of the monetary system and the commercial banks. Individual governments in, the, in our currency union are at liberty to divine and massage its fiscal frameworks within an increasingly consensual fiscal responsibility covenant, inclusive of a coordinated debt management strategy. We in the currency union, we have recognized that monetary and financial sector stability cannot be divorced from the fiscal and debt management frameworks. And both of these are linked inextricably to the issues of growth, competitiveness, job creation, and equity. In the ECCU, and I'm putting all of this out to show where we are, and if persons want us to move from here to go somewhere else, A, you have to tell me how it's going to work. I haven't seen how it's going to work. But we need certain things. We need certain things. In the currency union, pursuant to Article 24, 2 of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Agreement Act 1883, the ECCB is required to, at all times, maintain the external reserve in an amount not less than 60% of the value of the currency issued or deemed by the bank to have been <coughs> issued by it and in circulation and other demand liabilities but excluding coins issued for commemoration purposes. Faced with increasing global economic uncertainties, we in the ECCU 
decided in June 2001 to maintain an operational level of hard currency backing for the EC dollar of 80%. It lost us 60%. I was part of the decision which says, okay, it's 60%. But in the troubled times in which we are finding ourselves, and this is June 2001, shortly after I got to office, I said, let us put an operational level which is even higher, 80% backing. This operational backing ratio goes beyond the sound practice of 60%. It indicates the resilience of our currency arrangement and continues to support the demand for international reserves, particularly in a context of our fix, our current fixed exchange rate regime. For over 30 years, the currency union's exchange rate has been fixed at $2.70 US to $1, and it has never been altered. At the end, of 2017, a summary of the status of the ECCB reserves is as follows. Backing, ra backing ratio, 60%, 80% operational. The actual reserve level at the end of 2017 is 97.1%. So that when you have when you have this in your pocket, and I want to go out there, and I want to get some US dollars, all I have to do, I have to give one of the officers, say, take this to the bank and get some US dollars for me. And I'm not worried. I know I'm getting them. I ain't lining up. <laughs> huh? You see why this thing is so serious? Import cover, what you may say, the conventional cover, the benchmark is three months. The ECCB reserve level is ten and a half months. The import cover from the ECCB reserves only. Benchmark is three months, but the, the ECCB reserve level, 5.3 months. These are fundamental parameters. We in the ECCU have chosen this safe, secure, and stable monetary policy. Because in our context, we consider it to be to the overall benefit and future sustainability of our economies. Even though we recognize that it probably curtails our economic growth by around 1% annually. We could come down from it, you know. And we can have more EC dollars in circulation than the backing that we have. And you will get a little more investment, you'll get a few more jobs. But we notice what happens when some countries like Jamaica and Guyana use the central bank for those developmental purposes, what happens to the currency and the tailspin which they went into. And Trinidad was safe from that because of oil and natural gas. So even though we have to tighten ourselves a little, we prefer to be safe, secure, and sustainable. And where we would have, we could have gotten a little bit more growth, economic growth, we seek to make that up, that deficiency, on the fiscal investment and competitive side. That's why we have to work harder. That's why the public servants have to deliver more, the workers, the management, etc., etc. We have to make sure we're more efficient, cut out waste, and so on and so forth. Because we're running a particular monetary policy, which is giving us a lot of safety. But sustainability. So, the query which I have is this. Would the effective macroeconomic convergence inclusive of a full currency convertibility and a common enforceable fiscal responsibility framework, presumably required for the CSME, would all of that undermine or diminish in any practical, practicable way 
the ECC use monetary policy, its fixed exchange status, monetary and financial sector stability. Important question. And those who want us to go forward, I have to explain that to me. And to all of us. The currency of the ECCU dollar, ECCU, the EC dollar, is already fully convertible to the US dollar. Would the rest of the CSME approach the ECCU level as the veritable benchmark, or would the ECCU be required to move towards other more liberal or unsustainable currency arrangements? From March 29, 2001, until November the 20th, 2017, I have been a member of the Monetary Council of the Currency Union. Indeed, I've been advised that I've been the longest serving member continuously since the founding of the ECCU. And as you know, I have been around as Minister of Finance for a similar length of time. And I have learned not to trifle with monetary and financial sector stability. I know the attendant challenges in small economies in these respects. I know too the, creative, the creativity required to survive and thrive. So I will not rush into effective full macroeconomic convergence in the CSME just yet. I believe that my colleagues in the OECS share a similar viewpoint. On the matter of the Golden's report, urgent call for Full free movement of people throughout the community as vital for the five-year timetable for the operation of the CSME. I observe first that in 1961, 56 years ago, his Labour Party, I'm talking about Jamaica Labour Party, I'm talking about Bruce's. Admittedly, my friend Bruce was then about 13 years old, so I can't hold him responsible for that. But I observed that 56 years ago, in 1961, the Jamaica Labour Party led Jamaica out of the West Indies Federation, in part on the fear that tens of thousands of small islanders were poised to swamp Jamaica and suckle its proverbial milk, which was held to be the exclusive birthrights of Jamaicans only. What goes around, comes around. I agree that an effective CSME demands a full free movement of people throughout the community. I agree with that. To have a single economy, we have to have full free movement. Can't disagree with my friend Bruce Golden on that. The reality though, is that this is most unlikely to happen. I don't want to say impossible because miracles sometimes do take place. I can only deal with what I see as reasonable probabilities and I think it's highly unlikely to happen. Comparisons with the European Union in this regard are purely academic. Let us be realistic. Other than Trinidad and Tobago with a 5% unemployment rate, the member states of the CSME have unemployment rates ranging between 12 and 25% of the labor force. Youth employment is even higher. Jamaica's labor force is approximately 1.38 million. They have a population of 2.8. Their labor force is about 1.38 million. 14% of whom, or 200, nearly 200,000 persons, are unemployed. So they have a population of 2.8 million. They have a lot of people employed, but as we saw, they're employed with a per capita GDP of just $5,000, and the lowest in our part is between $7,000 and something, rising into St. Kitts to $15,000. I have to speak the complete truth. This number of 200000 persons, unemployment, number in Jamaica. This number is more than twice the entire population of Antigua and Barbuda. 
more than three times the population of St. Kitts and Nevis. Almost three times the population of Dominica. Almost twice the populations of Grenada and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Slightly more than the population of St. Lucia. 70% of the population of Barbados and 15% of the population of Trinidad and Tobago. The per capita GDP of Jamaica, I remind us, is 5,203 US dollars. The per capita GDP of the OECS members range from 7,002 US dollars to US 14,123. Per capita GDP of Barbados, 15,454 US. And that of Trinidad and Tobago is 18,798 US. Similar statistics we can point in, in the case of Guyana. Guyana has a population of 70, 770,749 and a per capita GDP of US 4,490. The question is this. Would full free movement of people in the CSME not prompt a flood of migrants to the OECS member states, particularly countries with nominally higher per capita income, such as the Leeward Islands, Barbados, and Trinidad and Tobago. First question. Second one. Would the domestic populations, you and those in other places which I talk about in the region, would the domestic populations in these potential host countries Commit their governments to allow this full free influx. <laughs> this is not an issue of chauvinism. I am talking the real world. By setting up this full free movement of people as a sine qua non for the CSME's attainment within five years, has the Golden Report not advanced? An, un an unachievable goal, which it insists is a condition for Jamaica to remain in the CSME. Is the more measured approach to this matter, as envisaged by the revised treaty in Articles 45 and 46, and expanded by the heads of government, not more realistic in all the circumstances? I think so. The more measured report approach involves CARICOM skills national certificates, um, sportspersons, household workers, university graduates, technical people of one kind or other, tradesmen and women, so that we get persons with skills who can assist us in the development of our respective countries. And that regime is set up. Maybe we need to make, and certainly I think we could make that regime better because there are some roadblocks put in it. That's not the purpose of today's discussion, because I've already said that many aspects of the single market, which would involve that kind of regime, we can do better. But that doesn't mean that we have to go the extent. Now, if you set up a condition that you must have full free movement of labor within five years, and if it, that doesn't happen, like the macroeconomic convert, convergence you're pulling out. Well, if both of those are unachievable in the current circumstances, what conclusion can a reasonable persons come to? In the same way that the political market cannot bear a political union of the CARICOM member states, I consider that the economic and political circumstances are not propitious for effective macroeconomic convergence and full free movement of people within the foreseeable future. But the non-attainment of the maximalist CSME goal in five years, or foreseeably, does not mean that we ought to embrace only a minimalist agenda, focus merely on basic functional cooperation, security linkages, and foreign policy coordination. Indeed, in these three areas, there is much to be done, so too in the area of trade and the single market. 
more optimal work is possible and achievable in these areas for the benefit of all our people. Thus, the immediate efforts of the OECS, including St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in CARICOM, ought to be focused on the following. One, push for an amendment to the revised Treaty of Shagaramas for a special carve-out for the OECS to accommodate the economic union of the OECS established in 2010 by the revised Treaty of last year. Two, strengthen operationally Chapter 7 of the Revised Treaty of Shagaramas to protect better the interests of disadvantaged countries, regions, and sectors. The Golden Reports want to water that down. I want to go in the other direction. Three, consolidate and extend the efficacious operation of functional cooperation, security arrangements, foreign policy coordination, and the trade single market activities. Four, Revamp CARICOM's governance structures to accommodate, in a measured way, supranational initiatives in the areas of integration, including trade and economic integration. Five, upgrade and enhance the structure and functioning of the Secretariat. Six, improve intra CARICOM air and sea travel in every material particular. Seven, settle a bundle of outstanding matters. Among the major ones of immediate concern for St. Vincent and the Grenadines are the pricing and trade in energy supplies, the unfair and wrong denial of or restriction on the availability of foreign exchange to small traders who sell their commodities in Trinidad and Tobago, the failure and or refusal of the government of Trinidad and Tobago to pay in part or in whole the outstanding sum of US $64 million solemnly agreed at CARICOM for BICO policyholders in the OECS member countries. The need for transparency, accountability, and proper representation for the OECS and Barbados in respect of the Caribbean Air Navigation Advisory Services, CANAS, the signing and ratification of the revised Multilateral Air Services Agreement, the MASA, and the enhancement of popular oversight of the West Indies cricket as a public good. I want to turn to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Regional Integration Movement and then to look briefly at the likely future of integration in the Caribbean and then I'll sign off. So St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Regional Integration Movement. St. Vincent and the Grenadines over several administrations, before and after independence in 1979, has been committed to the deepening of the process of regional integration. During the life of successive governments, continuously under my leadership since March 29, 2001, this practical commitment to regional integration has deepened profoundly. Today, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is an activist leader in the many overarching regional entities to which it belongs, including CARICOM, the OECS, the Association of Caribbean States, the Community of States of Latin America and the Caribbean, the Bolivarian Alternative for Latin America, ALBA, and Petro Caribbean. Under the umbrella of our primary regional integration mechanisms, CARICOM and the OECS, those are the two primary ones, there are numerous regional bodies in which St. Vincent and the Grenadines has membership. Additionally, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is a member state of a number of associate or allied regional entities which themselves are not necessarily formal institutions of CARICOM or the OECS. And if you would like, if you would like to see these these bodies, there are about 40 of them. You can look in the appendix of our, the estimates for 2018 and you will see that they are listed under the various ministries because they have to receive contributions. And annually, we make contributions and subscribe to these organizations amounting to over $15 million a year. And the main contributions, annual contributions are to UWI, the OECS, 
the our Supreme Court, Regional Security System, Caribbean Development Bank, Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority, the CARICOM Secretariat, and CARTAC. CARTAC is a, the, the Caribbean um, Research and Technical Assistance Center. They do a lot of work with us. And we benefit immensely from all of these organizations. And we have spoken about that repeatedly, so I don't have to canvas that here. Though I have written, I have put it in the, in the, the paper here. <coughs> the salience of these regional integration mechanisms to St. Vincent and Grenadines has been repeatedly emphasized by my government. Thus I find quite troubling and unacceptable the recommendation made by the Golden Report to quote, establish within the treaty a body of sanctions for willful non-compliance of flagrant breaches that would include, among other things, restricted access to policy-based loans or grants from the Caribbean Development Bank. Unquote. Clearly, this is, an this is an egregious example of overreach by the Golden Report. It is playing around and it has no chance of happening. The CDB has its own charter, rules and legal personality, separate and distinct from CARICOM. In fact, the CDB is not an institution of CARICOM. In Article 22 of the revised treaty, it is listed merely as an associate institution of, CAR of the community, in the same way that the OECSC is, UWI, University of Guyana, Caribbean Law Institute, those kinds of organizations. The CDB has borrowing members, which are in CARICOM, but also has several non-borrowing members, including Canada, China, United Kingdom, Germany, Mexico, Venezuela. CARICOM has absolutely no control over the CDB and cannot thus create some far-fetched sanction through the medium of the CDB for some willful non-compliance of flagrant breaches in CARICOM itself. In any event, CDB's loans, policy loans and limited grants are already possessed of their own restrictions and conditions entirely unconnected to CARICOM. For St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the CDB as our premier regional develop, fin, development finance institution is sacrosanct and immune from interference by CARICOM. Currently, we owe the public sector in this country owes the CDB just under $350 million for all kind of development, social economic development, infrastructural development, Vinlek owes CDB. I don't know if that's CWSA or CDB, but a number of institutions, plus, of course, the central government. In looking at where we are in the, where we are in the regional integration movement, we can't talk abstractly. I want to talk about trade. Because people think this is an esoteric subject. But you better believe it. You better, if you're a serious person, you have to think about trade. Importantly export trade. Think about import trade to be importantly export trade. That's in part why we build an airport, why we're going to build a new um, cargo, cargo port, and, and other things. This is why it's important. St. Vincent and the Grenadines does not have, at the moment, a large visible export trade, particularly since the demise of the banana industry, consequent upon the diminution leading to a virtual cessation of market preferences for its bananas in the United Kingdom, subsequent to the 1992 entry of that country into the European single market. In 2010, St. Vincent and the Grenadines' visible exports amounted to 41.08 million US dollars, <coughs> rising to US 
45.11 million in 2014. By far the bulk of St. Vincent de Grenadines' visible export trade is within CARICOM, mainly to the other OECS countries, Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago. In 2010, St. Vincent and the Grenadines intra-regional exports, that is within CARICOM, amounted to US $32.42 million, or 79% of the total export trade. In 2014, St. Vincent and the Grenadines intra-regional exports amounted to US $38.82 million, or 86% of its total trade. Most of the, expo the exports have been agricultural products and manufacturing commodities such as flour, animal feed, and beer. You understand why this is so important to us? 86% of our trade is within CARICOM. Only St. Lucia in the OECS has a higher level of intra-regional export trade than St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In 2010, St. Lucia's intra-regional exports amounted to 69.53 million US dollars, more than twice the comparable figure for our country. In 2014, St. Lucia's intra-regional exports had fallen to US 41.86 million, or just a mere 3.04 million US dollars over the comparable number for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The intra-regional exports in 2014 for the other OECS countries in CARICOM were Antigua and Barbuda, and these numbers I'm giving are US numbers. Five. 0.15 million dollars, that's what they exported. In goods, of course, Antigua's economy is tourism. Goods, Dominica, 38.7 million dollars. Grenada, 7.12 million. You hear a lot of talk up and down that if only we can do as well as Grenada in exporting, with so much sour sap and so on, they exported seven million. <laughs> well, we exported 38.82 million. This is why it's good. The numbers are there, you know, you just have to look at them. Don't listen to fraud. That doesn't mean we shouldn't export sour sap. <laughs> um, St. Kitts Nevis, 7.7 .7 million. St. Kitts has tourism and, pla and passports. <laughs> Montserrat, 1.22 million. In 2014, the total intra-regional exports from these OECS member countries amounted to 101.87 million US dollars. In 2014, the other LDC, Belize, and the five MDCs in the CSME, Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago, had a total intra-regional trade of 2.6 billion US dollars, of which Trinidad and Tobago accounted for a whopping 1.93 billion US, or 74.2% thereof. The export trade carry on. And men and women, they don't want to give me a little money for the farmers. <laughs> Barbados exported in that year, 2014, US won 67.02 million. Guyana won 24.32 million US. Jamaica, 89.82 million US. And Suriname, 290.75 million US. If I can I leave Haiti, I'm going to Suriname. The statistics on CARICOM's intra-regional imports, we dealt with the exports now, 
imports are instructive. The five MDCs imported intra-regionally goods amounted to 2.36 billion, of which Trinidad and Tobago accounted for only 190.2 million. Well, if your energy is cheap, I mean, how you, and while all this is happening, you know, some people were talking about not being an ATM machine. <laughs> the 190 million US dollars which Trinidad and Tobago imported in 2014 intra-regionally is far smaller, far lower level of imports than any of the other four MDCs in CSME. Jamaica, and I can understand why Jamaica is getting a little antsy. Jamaica is the largest intra-regional importer accounted for US 763.87 million US dollars, or 27% of the intra-regional intra CSME import trade. And of course, they have very little exports to us in the rest of the Caribbean. The six independent countries plus Montserrat imported intra-regionally. These six countries in the OECS and Montserrat imported $487.5 million US in goods. Trinidad imported 190. Thus, these OECS member countries had an intra-regional visible trade deficit of 385.63 million US dollars. <coughs> now, I want to do a little <coughs> more detailed interrogation of the statistics relating to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But before I do so, I just want to make the point that the visible trade balance on intra-regional trade in 2014 for the five MDCs in the CSME, four of them had large deficits. The only one which had a trade surplus was trying to have them to be. I have numbers here. You could. Since I'm going to give you some more numbers, I wouldn't call those out. You can always read them. But the point is made. I want to do a little bit more detailed interrogation of the statistics relating to our own countries into regional trade, because this would be of practical interest to policymakers, exporters, and importers. So I'm going to examine data in 2016, or some of the data for 2017 is still provisional, have to be corrected and the like, so I want to use the 2016 data. <coughs> and I want to thank Ecolo for, for, for providing me with a lot of the data. And I want to use EC dollars, so you don't have to, since I'm talking to a Vincent an audience, I don't want you to do any conversion on this one. When I was dealing comparatively with the others, use the US. But I want to deal with easy dollars. In 2016, St. Vincent and the Grenadines' is intra-regional imports amounted to $212.9 million. Its intra-regional exports valued 105 point, 100 and Point five million dollars, giving rise to a visible trade deficit of one hundred and twelve point four million dollars EC. The principal sources of St. Vincent and the Grenadines intra-regional imports in twenty sixteen were we imported one hundred and forty six point four million dollars 
from Trinidad and Tobago. $26.6 million worth of goods from Barbados. $16.87 million from Guyana. $10.4 million EC from Jamaica. And $5.5 million from St. Lucia. Of course, the bulk of what we buy from Trinidad energy and energy products, petroleum products, but we buy a significant amount of manufacturing goods. I'm not talking services yet, you know. There's a, there's a different issue, the services which we buy from Trinidad. I mean, the, right in this building, the elevator which you go up in, came up in, the service by a Trinidadian company, you know. That's just a, that's just a small one, but they're all over the country. We have services provided. And I'm not, I'm not knocking it, you know, I'm just taking it as a fact. What are the main intra-regional destinations for St. Vincent and the Grenadines is exports in 2016? The places where we sell the most to. St. Lucia, 19.95 million EC dollars. I heard some people say, when Mr. Chastany, my friend, came to office, what oh, kind of man Ralph be? Ralph is some kind of a lizard, he changed his complexion. Look at how Chastany is there. When Kenny was there, he talking good to Kenny, and now Chastany is there. We sell them 20 million dollars. He's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> When we write things, they don't have the responsibility I have, you know. <laughs> Trinidad and Tobago, $17.2 million. Antigua and Barbuda, $16.97 million. Dominica, $9.36 million. St. Kitts Nevis, $7.88 million. Grenada, $3.99 million. Belize, $3.68 million. Jamaica, $841,000. Suriname, $407,000. Guyana, $182,000. So you see the importance of, for our export market, St. Lucia, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago for our produce, agricultural produce, a few other things. Antigua and Barbuda in respect of our flour. St. Lucia, our flour and our animal feed and other things, and Barbados, a lot of bear. We had one, we not too long ago had over 20% of the bear market. But what you have to be mindful of is this. The company which bought, the international company which bought the, the brewery in Dominican Republic, also bought the brewery here and bought banks in Barbados. Well, banks is now producing a bear to replace the higher one which people in Barbados love, called deputy. <laughs> <laughs> so we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be selling as much bear to Barbados as before, though some people still want the higher one. Um, so we have to Try and see if we can get into markets like Belize. But fortunately, we also, we, 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 we here in our brewery, I don't know if you know this, the bear which is, when you go to Antigua and you see a bear called Wadali, it's made, it's made here. You know, and uh, got the same company alone, they brew in there. And we are currently making Kubuli, the Dominica bear, because their factory got destroyed during the <laughs> during the hurricane. So you have to, apart from following the trade, you can follow the money too. <laughs> St. Vincent the Grenadines thus imported from four of the MDCs, Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago in 2016 goods to the value of 200.81 million 
or 94% of its regional, intra-regional imports. So we bought most of our imports intra-regionally, intra-regional one, from those four countries. In these, to these same MDCs, St. Vincent and Grenadines exported in 2016 goods to the value of $37.6 million, or 37% of its intra-regional exports. But hear this. At the same time, St. Vincent and the Grenadines exports to the OECS countries in 2016 amounted to EC 58 $0.84 million or 58% of its intra-regional exports. You see why I need to have a carve out in the treaty for the OECS Economic Union. These are not just ideas in the sky. These are ideas related to an analysis of what is happening. And we imported from the OECS member countries in 2016 only $10.13 million. In short, the OECS as a whole is by far a more important export market for St. Vincent and the Grenadines than the MDCs. And in 2016, St. Vincent and the Grenadines had a trade surplus with the OECS member countries of $48 million. On the other hand, St. Vincent and the Grenadines had a trade deficit in 2016 with these four MDCs, Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago. And that deficit was of $163.21 million. Barbados is the MDC with which St. Vincent and the had the most equitable trade in 2016. We imported 26.6 million and we sold them almost 20 million. Not bad. Clearly, this trade nexus is something which we must cultivate more. And you understand why I'm saying that I could see us with our convergence with Barbados. Good place to go. <laughs> I thought you would say that. <laughs> given the importance of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, given the importance to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, of its export trade to the OECS member countries, the protection accorded it as an LDC under Article 164 of the Revised Treaty of Chagaramos looms significantly. For example, the protection offered to St. Vincent and the Grenadines flower and animal feed, a protection which expires in December 2018 unless quoted renews it, is closely monitored by our government. In effect, this market protection mandates the payment of the common external tariff of 15% on exports of flower and animal feed from a CARICOM MDC to a CARICOM LDC. The evidence indicates that exports are flour, but ours don't have the 15% because it's protected. But evidence indicates that exports are flour from a, spe from a specific CARICOM MDC to a specific CARICOM LDC has occurred in breach of Article 164, that is without the payment of the CEP. This breach of Article 164 by the MDC exporter and the LDC importer has occasioned a significant drop in St. Vincent and the Grenadines exports of flour to that CARICOM LDC. Notice I'm not calling the names. <laughs> For instance, between 2014 and 2015, there was a drop of 64 metric tons of flour to that country. Between 2015 and 2016, a drop of 322 metric tons. And when you look at the trade statistics, 
You will see from the particular MDC to that particular LDC, their exports of flour went up. But that is not. We had, we had agreed only the last time when we negotiated the extension of the Article 164 was that they must purchase only the, the flour, the packaged flour, not the baker's flour in the bags. <laughs> um, <coughs> it appears as though a similar situation obtains in relation to animal feed, <coughs> but involving another MDC exporter and another LDC <coughs> importer. <coughs> now, I want to show you the problem which we have been having in Trinidad with our exports. I've already <coughs> given the data. But it is clear that the foreign exchange problem has affected both the volume and the value of exports from St. Vincent to Trinidad and Tobago. In 2015, we exported to Trinidad and Tobago 13.24 million kilograms of net weight of goods at a value of $21 million. In 2016, these numbers fell to 11.08 million kilograms of goods with a value of $17.19 million. In 2017, the numbers fell further to 6.8 kilograms of goods with a value of $11 million. So the numbers going down both in the volume and the value. And the reason for this is that the farmers are not planting for Trinidad or selling to the people of Trinidad because they can't get their money. Farmers are not irrational, you know. Sometimes people in town think they are. <laughs> I could tell you. They know how school keep it. Now we make up our deficit in visible trade by trade and services. And most of the economies in the OECS, St. Vincent and Grandis is now a service economy, about 80% with services. But for us still, agriculture and fisheries and forestry are very important, both for our domestic consumption and also for export. Now, if and now we are talking about medicinal marijuana. Now the point about it is this. If we cannot get all foreign exchange, this is a serious problem in the single market. And we are solving that and you want to take me to the single economy with all the challenges which I spoke about earlier. And of course, in our region, as the business people know, the control of inland revenue is here. When you sell, when you, when you export to the OECS countries, on your chargeable income, you pay 15% cooperation tax. If you sell to the CARICOM countries, it's either 20 or 25% you pay. But you know the normal tax, since the Minister of Finance has brought it down, is 30 at the top. I want to say something about the likely future of integration in the Caribbean. I, I appeared before the Golden Commission in Jamaica by invitation. And among other things, I submitted to the Commission a perspective on the prospective future of regional integration in the Caribbean. The essence of my thesis in this regard, which I had articulated hitherto, was that given the impact of globalization in all its dimensions and the nature of the regional economy and the limitations of the trade and economic aspects of CARICOM, at least two poles, P-O-L-E-S, of regional integration are likely to emerge in concert with the CARICOM co construct itself. A northern pole of integration in the northern Caribbean based on enhanced trade 
and economic integration that's likely to be fashioned, including Jamaica, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Cuba, the Bahamas, and in due course, possibly Puerto Rico. A second pool of deepened socioeconomic integration centered in the OECS member countries, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, and possibly Suriname, is likely to be consolidated. Belize's economic and trading fortunes regionally are inextricably linked to the Central American Integration System, SICA, which includes Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, and the Dominican Republic. Within the second pool, the Economic Union and Confederal Political Arrangement in the OECS will retain its distinctiveness and uniqueness. In time, Barbados may seek entry to the OECS or some formal associate relationship with it, as Martinique and Guadalupe have done. Crisscrossing these two central poles of integration is likely to be Trinidad and Tobago, given its petroleum and natural gas resources. And Guyana too, given its abundant natural resources, geographic size, and its recent entry into potentially lucrative oil exploration and production commercially. CARICOM will continue to evolve and consolidate, but with different tracks for different countries, a kind of flexible or variable geometry of integration. Already Bahamas is within CARICOM, but has not signed on to the trading and economic arrangements of the CSME. Jamaica is possibly on track in precisely the same direction. Well, Golden has said that. Belize is probably headed that way too. And depending on what happens in the prospective northern pole of integration, Haiti may do the same while remaining anchored in CARICOM in its functional cooperation, foreign policy coordination, and security connections. CARICOM, in any event, is likely to remain a central political expression of all Caribbean civilization. The Golden Report is spot on with its analytic insight that, quote, globalization is continuously reshaping the geography of production and consumption, and thereby the patterns of trade across the world, and it threatens to marginalize small countries that have not yet developed the capacity and resilience to withstand the intensity and competitiveness of that new paradigm. This provides even more urgent and compelling reasons for regional integration among a group of neighboring countries whose people already share in common in terms of history, culture, and experiences, unquote. This perspective is quite consistent with a two-pole integration process, an OECS carve-out in CARICOM, crisscrossing energy-based economies, and an evolving CARICOM, which anchors our Caribbean civilization short of a single economy, but consolidating its gains, its gains in the single market, functional cooperation, foreign policy coordination, and security collaboration. There is in fact a pact and meaningful agenda in these areas of CARICOM. And when you interrogate the numbers for the global trade, CARICOM and the rest of the world, you will see that the, the top 10 countries in which CARICOM member countries imported in 2014, in order, the USA, Gabon, 8.8%, Trinidad and Tobago, China, Colombia, Russian Federation, Venezuela, Brazil, Japan, and the United Kingdom. And the top 10 countries that we exported goods to well, the United States of America, 29%, Canada, 3%, Brazil, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, United Arab Emirates, Spain, Guyana, Netherlands, United Kingdom. Now, when you examine the numbers, you see that these numbers must influence you as to how you're thinking about the direction where the regional integration movement is going because we are not immune to being incorporated 
in the world trading system. In fact, we are very much in it. And we have to devise our structures within Caribbean, within CARICOM, in the light of that reality. My final comment, the integration process in the Caribbean has always been marked by distinct but connected circles of integration. The most tightly drawn integration mechanism is the OECS. More loosely is CARICOM. Then there's the ACS, with, which links the English, French, Dutch, and Spanish-speaking countries washed by the Caribbean Sea and has as its functional emphasis trade, technology, tourism, transport, and the management of natural disasters. CELAC, a hemispheric political body which includes all Caribbean and Latin American countries but which excludes the U.S. and Canada. And the political and economic Alba Petro-Carib Nexus which includes several Caribbean and Latin American countries in close tandem with Cuba and Venezuela. Each integration circle has its points of contact and relevance with others all of which are designed to advance the interests of their member countries in solidarity with each other. None of these integration circles undermines the integrity and efficacy of another. Indeed, they are all supplementary and complementary to each other in a dynamic integration process. At the same time, CARICOM has negotiated trade agreements with several countries including Canada, Cuba, the Dominican Republic and a trade and development agreement with the European Union. CARICOM too has a non-reciprocal agreement with the USA on a limited range of commodities through the Caribbean Basin Initiative. Our Caribbean history teaches that the regional integration enterprise assumes various forms and varied content. We must not be so dogmatic as to ignore realities in our quest for the most appropriate integration mechanisms, ranging from minimalist to maximalist, consonant with all the practical circumstances. Yet we ought never to allow a practical attachment to a flexible or variable geometry of integration to still the longest deepest yearnings of our Caribbean civilization to fashion an institutional expression of regional integration which accords with our shared expressions and sense of existential belonging to our magnificent landscape and seascape. All what I've said here today represents my mature understanding of where we are generally in the regional economic enterprise, integration enterprise, and specifically in relation to CARICOM. St. Vincent and the Grenadines reiterates its commitment to deepening and broadening in all the practical, practical circumstances the process of regional integration in the collective interest of our people's further development. Thank you. And without further delay, I want to thank you, Prime Minister, Dr. Young Ravi Gonsalves, for that lecture. I think we all are better informed on the history, the law, the economics, the politics, of CARICOM and the reality that it faces now and in the future. And again, thank you very much, Prime Minister, and thank you to all of you who turned out this morning. We understand that the Ed flight is already on the ground, so we will not. <laughs>